Yep. Uh, we have with us today all three members of the commission in the center, the chair, uh, Mr. Mohammed Chande Otman. Um, uh, to my right, uh, we have Ms. Uh, Radhika uh, Kamaraswamy. And uh, on, on my far right, we have uh, Mr. Stephen Ratner. Um, the commissioners will be sharing with you the findings of their latest uh, report. And although this report is being made public today, um, it will be officially presented to the Human Rights Council um, at the end of the week on Thursday, 21st of uh, September. Um, so now uh, the chair will make an opening statement and then we'll open the floor to questions. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, uh, today. My fellow commissioners and myself uh, released the second report to the uh, Human Rights Council. This is a report of the International Commission of Human Rights Experts uh, uh, on Ethiopia. Our investigation over the last year has shown that despite the signing of the cessation of hostilities agreement in Pretoria last November, more than 10 months later, the situation in Ethiopia remains grave the signing of the agreement has neither resolved the conflict nor brought about comprehensive peace. Violent confrontations in Ethiopia are now at a near national scale with significant violations ongoing in Tigray and Oromia and increasingly in Amhara region. It is hard to overstate the gravity of the violence which has taken place in Ethiopia since November 2020. We have documented mass killings, rape, starvation, destruction of schools and medical facilities, forced displacement, and mass arbitrary detention amounting to both war crimes and crimes against humanity. Many of these violations are ongoing our lesser report confirms that Eritrean troops and Amhara forces and militia members continue to commit grave violations in Tigray, including rape and sexual violence of women and girls. We also documented the continued forced expulsion of Tigrayans from Western Tigray, with tens of thousands of women, men, and children unable to return uh, to their homes. In Oromia, one of the regions, we uncovered an ongoing pattern by government forces of arrest, detention, and torture of civilians, in particular men and boys, accused of links with the Oromo Liberation Army, as well as other extrajudicial killing of civilians and sexual violence against women and girls. In Amhara, violence has escalated between state forces and Fano militia members since August this year, and the situation is now characterized by use of happy weaponry, at least one drone strike carried out by the state, including widespread arbitrary arrests and detention of civilians and extrajudicial killings. The need for a credible, inclusive, and meaningful process of justice, truth, reconciliation, and healing has never been more urgent. Ethiopia's current transitional justice consultations are not that process. Our engagement with hundreds of victims, survivors, and their families relieve deep mistrust in the ability and willingness of Ethiopian institutions to deliver transitional justice. Our own assessment bears out that the current transitional justice process lacks inclusivity, transparency, and is being rushed to meet an arbitrary deadline set by the government. What is more, as it stands today, Ethiopia is not able to prosecute international crimes at the domestic level in line with international law and standards. So prospects, in our view, of accountability for atrocity crimes committed by Eritrean forces are virtually non-existent. When we observe current transitional justice initiatives in Ethiopia, it is hard not to be struck by the evidence of quasi-compliance. Deliberate attempts by the government to evade international scrutiny through the creation of domestic mechanisms and instrumentalization of others. 
This has served primarily to elevate international pressure and prevent stronger international engagement for investigations. For the hundreds of thousands of victims of atrocities across Ethiopia, this cannot and should not be allowed to continue. The Commission's findings of ongoing patterns of violence and violations and crimes and of failure to ensure credible transitional justice are very serious. At the same time, the Commission notes a broader and equally alarming pattern of increasing secularization of the state, in particular through the imposition of state of emergencies and the establishment of command posts and other military structures without civilian oversight. This situation is especially alarming in the context of the deteriorating situation in Amhara region. Entrenched patterns of grave violation and increasing secularization of the state through curfews and state of, states of emergencies bear hallmark risks of further atrocity crimes. We conclude our report by assessing that most of the indicators and triggers for atrocity crimes remain present in Ethiopia and urge stronger and ongoing independent monitoring and investigation uh, of the situation. Uh, maybe before I uh, invite you for questions, I want my, I would invite my two commissioners to say very briefly a couple of remarks. Uh, please, Radhika and then Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, all commissioners welcomed uh, the cessation of hostilities agreement. Like all of you, we were looking toward its rapid implementation and establishment of peace and justice. It was a major landmark, and we all appreciated the effort that went into making it a reality. But our investigations show that the hopes of COHA have not been realized for a variety of reasons, and in fact, there is the presence of indicators for possibility of future atrocity crimes. The agreement appears to be between two ethnic groups. What is needed is a comprehensive peace agreement involving all Ethiopians, and we are deeply concerned about the situation in, in Amhara, and we are also worried that there is no process that is ongoing that will lead to effective accountability. And we're also concerned about the Eritrean forces who, according to our research, have committed the worst atrocities, especially with regard to sexual violence, especially in the border areas, and the prospect that they face no accountability at all. Let me just say that um, all this has implications for transitional justice. The Ethiopians have put forward their strategy, but uh, I think uh, we find, uh, we have mentioned that in our report that we do find this lacking in transparency and, uh, and uh, um, uh, agency. We try to engage with the Ethiopian government in transitional justice issues, but they did not uh, respond. Um, as, as required by my, our mandate, we therefore organized a conference in uh, Nairobi where victims and stakeholders from all over Ethiopia came. We remain one of the few institutions that enjoy the confidence of all victims of all communities, including the minorities of the Yoruba, Kumana, and Kement communities, and of every ethnic group, whether it is Amhara, Tigray, or Afar. The participants came from every part of Ethiopia. They pointed out that they had no faith in the current system, and they, uh, they were also concerned about the climate of fear that often goes along with this transitional justice process. So let me just say Ethiopia is a country in turmoil and reiterate that there must be regional and international oversight. The AU, we, we were hoping that COHA would lead to a robust regional process for human rights. That has no, not developed. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the African Commission on Ethiopia has closed down, and we therefore feel that there is a real need for international investigation of what is going on in Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
I would just want to reiterate a few points regarding the investigative part of our mandate. Um, our mandate be was to look at the period beginning of November of 2020 and went through um, the, end, the middle of this summer when we began to write the report. Um, we reaffirmed our findings from our first report, which was only able to look at a small number of incidents by looking at a far greater number of incidents and we reaffirmed findings of significant violations of international human rights law, humanitarian law, and international criminal law, um, some of which amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, the war crimes findings were based on a careful review of, of the actions of various parties, um, including the ENDF, the EDF, Amhara um, militias, and the Tigrayan forces. And the crimes against humanity findings were based on a review of the actions of the ENDF, the EDF, and the Amhara militias. Um, clearly, we have seen a deterioration in the situation in Ethiopia since our oral update to the Council in March of this year, um, including the spreading of violence to on the Amhara region and Aromia. Um, the ongoing violations are extraordinarily serious, and we have credible allegations of just, of just how, gra how grave they are. Uh, they include the forced displacement and the sexual and gender-based violence mentioned by the chair, uh, as well as uh, continued blockage of humanitarian assistance, again with the EDF and Amhara militias particularly um, at, uh, responsible regarding the areas of the north of the country. Um, in our view, um, we are witnessing a failure by Ethiopia to carry out its legal obligations to protect its own citizens against human rights violations by a foreign military actor on its territory, as well as by militias. And that is a finding that we uh, regard as a very serious one, um, because the state is ultimately responsible for protecting its own uh, population. Um, finally, let me just reiterate that, in a sense, just as uh, we uh, didn't have time for a full investigation for our first mandate, the eight or 12 months that we had for the second mandate uh, did also not allow us to engage in a complete investigation, and eventually we ran out of time because we had to begin writing this report. This underlines the importance of international scrutiny, scrutiny and further international independent investigations to determine exactly what is happening on the ground and the gravity of it. Uh, both with respect to accountability for past violations, but also equally important to prevent uh, a continuation of this war, to bring it to an end, and to provide peace for the people of Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, uh, um, everyone, for your opening remarks. Um, now we open the floor to uh, questions. Uh, do we have any uh, from the room? Okay. Um, online, we have uh, uh, one from Catherine. Uh, if you could please uh, identify yourself and the media outlet you work for, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Catherine fiancon Bokonga. I'm working for France 24, French International TV. Um, I'd like um, to ask a couple questions. First of all, uh, could you please repeat um, the, the time that means the time frame where you, you did investigate. The first one was November 2020 till middle December 2020. Could you please be a bit more precise about the dates? The second thing is I'd like to ask you that um, if you, you have the intention or you are um, at, at um, um, how can I say? Um, if you would like, as in the case of Syria, um, that a, a list, the establishment of a list of those possibly implicated in the crimes committed, so that later on courts can do their work um, and also for account uh, accountability. Um, is that uh, an option? And also, could you please elaborate a little bit more on your uh, wish of an international independent investigation? Thank you. Um, I, I will take the first two of your questions um, regarding the investigative work of the commission and its, uh, and its uh, team. 
um, the time frame for uh, this report um, extends back to the beginning of the mandate of November 3rd, 2020. And the investigation came to a close uh, formally uh, on about the 27th of June of this year so that we could then switch to the drafting of the report. At the same time, we continued to gather information after that period, uh, especially and, and regarding continued patterns of past atrocities, but also new information. So we do make reference to, um, to events uh, up until uh, the time we started drafting the report. Um, so it is, it is a comprehensive and looking back and looking as far forward as we were able to uh, before we essentially ran out of time. On your question about um, the list of those implicated, um, as you'll see from the report, uh, we do indeed have such a list. Um, we uh, are thus following the uh, uh, practice of other commissions of inquiry in um, gathering names of those we believe credibly are implicated in certain of the violations that we have identified uh, for use by future accountability mechanisms. Um, on the issue of future um, steps by the international community, I'll turn that over to the chair. Yeah, you may recall that uh, the resolutions, both of them that uh, established uh, uh, this commission called for a thorough investigation, and they use the word thorough uh, investigations. And uh, uh, we have managed, of course, to conduct this investigation mostly remotely uh, because of uh, not being able to have access uh, to the territory of Ethiopia for our investigators uh, to be able uh, to investigate. Uh, but we have relied on multiple sources uh, to beef up uh, that one-to-one -one direct investigation. So uh, both the two mandates have been able to, we've been able to conduct direct interviews with around, fi with around 545 witnesses, but to rely on, on, on other material. Uh, secondly, uh, our investigation, of course, has uh, 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 produced a number of findings but there is a certain limitation, and that is one of the areas where we emphasize in the report there is a need for further investigation. For example, our investigation has, lead, has led to uh, uh, the, the list of persons of interest that we have. But it, in order to deal with impunity, which is a main issue in Ethiopia, you have to go higher up the command so that you have also those who were involved in, in, in uh, directing others having superior responsibility or command responsibility. So much as we have uh, had a military advisor as part of our investigation team, that part has not been completed. So we said there are many, there are a number of gaps that you will need really to be investigated. Otherwise, as it stands right now, it means that that accountability would have a shortfall in terms of not having persons with the greatest responsibility uh, in the crimes committed in Ethiopia. So that is why we urge a continued investigation and the modality, of course, is up to the council to decide the modality, but the job given to us has those limitations in terms of the comprehensiveness of the investigation that we would like really at the end of the day to help in the accountability process, and we all agree it is accountability process first step in Ethiopia, and if it fails or it is unwilling, then we can d discuss about regional and other international uh, possi possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go next to uh, Gabrielle um, online. Uh, hello. Um, the question for the uh, the chairman, if possible. Um, what are the concerns you have um, going back on what you mentioned about impunity, about future impunity, given that war crimes are still being committed and your mandate is is coming to an end? Um, any specific concerns about the, the coinciding of the crimes and, and the end of the mandate? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, what, what we... Uh have done in the report, and this we will address uh, uh, and advise the council, is in our assessment, so the, the risks for
for atrocity crimes and their commission are clearly visible. And what we have used is we have used the UN framework of analysis for atrocity crimes, which provide the risk factors. There are common risk factors and then there are specific risk factors for particular crimes. So what are the risk factors that we uh, have pointed out? One is there's an ongoing uh, situation of violence, instability. We have recorded serious violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law, uh, and our report has sufficient evidence, uh, material, for example, not just of extrajudicial killings, but also uh, multi perpetrator rape, which were widespread, horrendous. Uh, the capacity of the warring factions to commit crimes is still there. Uh, 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 there is there is the use of of uh, of uh, discriminatory speech based on ethnicity. So these are all risk factors that we will draw attention of the council. That when you determine uh, the future of this mandate, that you take into account these risks which we have measured and which we rely, uh, uh, which we. Uh, which will bring to their to their to their notice. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, we'll go next to uh, Jamie Keaton from Associated Press. Great. Hi. Thank you, Todd. Um, my question is for uh, Madam uh, Kumaraswamy. Um, it has to do with the what uh, struck me as a, a pretty powerful figure in there about. Um, at least 10,000 survivors of sexual violence um, in uh, Tigray alone. I mean, could you just kind of put that into perspective for us in terms of what the significance of that is? And if you're concerned that that only masks just part of the situation of sexual violence and uh, rape and, 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 and other um, crimes um, in that regard in, um, in uh, Ethiopia, please. Thank you. Well, um the sexual violence crimes in this war um, are truly horrific. Uh, I think uh, um, I have personally interviewed um, uh, victims uh, of the sexual violence, so it's from first-hand information. I must say I have been to many conflicts, uh, Rwanda and many others. Uh, this was as bad as it gets. It's, uh, it was uh, extreme, I think included um, gang rape, uh, it included um, uh, cruelty of the worst kind. But I must admit that the worst of this was perpetrated by Eritrean forces in Tigray. Though, of course, um, the Ethiopian forces were also responsible. Uh, and I think uh, there was also uh, sexual violence in Amhara, uh, perpetrated by Tigrayan forces, which are also quite terrible. So sexual violence as, as a crime in this war is something of great significance and has to be looked into and accountability has to be had. When we had this meeting of um, victims from all over uh, Ethiopia, uh, the, vic the issue of sexual violence was very prominent. Uh, and I think that's why I feel uh, that all these forces, uh, all forces uh, that engaged in this, and they are not only the Ethiopian government forces, it's also Eritrean and now Tigray. Uh, I think it's important to have comprehensive uh, justice with regard to these issues. And also the paramilitaries, the FANO forces in Western Tigray, also terrible situation, terrible uh, crimes of sexual violence. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, do we have any more online or from the room? Going once, twice. Okay, oh, one uh, follow-up from Jamie. Thank you, um, Commissioner. I, I wanted to just maybe, uh, I see that my colleagues have also tried to sort of press upon this question, but um, the issue of a, a new mandate, I mean, is there, you know, how significant is that going to be for the country of Ethiopia? If issues like sexual violence, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and all the various abuses and violations that you've mentioned, do, do, go, uh, you know, 
don't have the benefit of the scrutiny from your commission or from other um, instances to ensure that uh, that uh, that the crimes will what could potentially one day be prosecuted in uh, in Ethiopia. Could, if you just give us a little bit of context in terms of broadly what this would mean if if there's no continuation of the mandate. Well, I'll just say very quickly and then hand it over to the chair, who should be the final word on that. I mean, I think history has shown us that non-prosecution uh, uh, is the first ground that there will be recurrence. Non-recurrence usually requires some kind of transitional justice process or some accountability process. Uh, so that's our concern as we watch what's evolving all around Ethiopia. Uh, that there will be recurrence of violence, not only in Tigray, but throughout Ethiopia, unless there is a comprehensive peace settlement, unless there is accountability for crimes. But I will just give it to the chairperson to... Yeah, yeah just to add, uh, what we understand from victims who have, we have consulted widely is that one of the uh, primary drivers of the conflict is impunity. And the Human Council resolution that establishes this mandate speaks about encouraging impunity being uh, 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 directly related to the reoccurrence of atrocity crimes. So I think impunity is, is essential. But also, I think, in terms of for Ethiopia, because Ethiopia is saying, and I think it has uh, that entitlement that it has primary responsibility for protection of its nationals. And the Human Rights Council resolution also recognizes that it is a primary responsibility of Ethiopia to protect its citizens, and that is why it is proposing so many measures. But our assessment is that those measures have not lived up to the standard. They have not produced, they are not credible, not only according to what we have assessed, but also including the victims that we have assessed. So it's time for Ethiopia in Avio to rethink uh, when it is advancing internationally, you know, that it is taking credible measures of accountability and so on. And that is why uh, we have used uh, this uh, notion or concept of quasi-compliance, uh, saying that to the international community, you should be wary about quasi-compliance, because at the end of the day, quasi-compliance really means that, you know, nothing is really happening at the domestic level, and therefore the risk factors reoccur in terms of atrocity crimes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If we don't have any more questions, um, that'll bring us to the end of this uh, press conference. Uh, do any of the members of the commission have any final uh, comments to make? No? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us and have a good day.